give thanks for the good days. When the traffic lights all turn green, when promotions come and bad habits are broken. Give thanks for warm meals and the company of friends. Give thanks for undeniable blessings and clear direction. When the music floods your soul and the worship songs flow without effort. Give thanks for coffee and clothing and hope that the two never mix. Give thanks for the mother who battles daily in prayer, for the father working three jobs, for the brothers and sisters who build blanket forts and read bedtime stories. Give thanks for sons and daughters and all our family who remind us of what truly matters. Give thanks for the stranger who holds the door open and the lifelong friend who holds you when life is broken. Give thanks for the hard days, for the phone call that brings life crashing down, for jobs lost and friendships fallen into conflict. Give thanks for the anger that reminds us we are human and the tears that express more than words could ever fathom. Give thanks, though the pain is overwhelming, your energy spent, your spirit fallen, and your only option is to fall to your knees before your Holy Father and cry out, God, please help me. For in that moment, his power is made perfect. His love is made evident. He becomes your strength, your comfort, and your salvation. Give thanks for the power of redemption, from Genesis to Revelation, for the endless promises of a God who would rather sacrifice his son than give up on his children for nail-pierced hands, for brilliant dawns, for the cool touch of rain and the simplicity of a quiet day, for all things great and small, let us give thanks.
i
Let's continue our worship through prayer. O Lord and Father of your children of faith, we thank you for the gift of working faith within us by your Holy Spirit. We confess that we are sinners and ask for your forgiveness through your gracious gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins. Jesus, your final words on the cross were, it is finished. We thank you for your completed work of salvation. We ask for your Holy Spirit to continue to live in us and guide us to live lives that conform to your will and your word. We pray for the leaders and members of your church worldwide in this church. Give us, your people, humility where there is pride, unity where there is division, truth where there is error, and wisdom where there is folly. May we grow in our personal relationship with Jesus Christ and be the hands and feet of Jesus in this world. Move us to be witnesses for you to those around us who have not trusted in Jesus as their Savior. 
Let us say with David in Psalm 124, our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. We pray for leaders of nations and leaders of governments at all levels. We see hate, injustice, and conflict around us and around the world. We pray that leaders might be led by you to provide peace and true justice. We know that all things are in your control, so we ask that you bless those who were elected in our country, that they may be guided by you. Give them wise advisors to help them in their work. We pray for a spiritual revival in our nation. One of the things you told Solomon after the dedication of the temple was, if my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. It seems that that would apply to us today as well. We pray for those who have special needs. To all who have been impacted by the natural disasters such as storms, drought, and famine, Grant them relief. To all who are persecuted for their faith in you, give them protection, encourage them, and may they remain strong in their faith. To all who suffer sickness or weakness, give health and strength. To all who are lonely and alienated, give fellowship and love. To all who grieve and sorrow, give comfort and assurance. To all who are aged and frail, give homes of comfort and safety, others to help them, and a willingness to accept that help. To all who struggle with financial needs, give them the resources that they need and the wisdom to use wisely the gifts that you have already given them. To all who struggle because of broken or strained relationships, give them wisdom, courage, and understanding. To all who feel not looked down upon, may they feel your love and know that you, that we are all one in Christ. To all who are impacted by the current COVID epidemic, grant them relief and give us the wisdom to learn the lessons you want us to learn from this experience. We pray for Pastor Clay as he shares with us from Romans 14. May his words be guided by your Holy Spirit, and may we be guided by the Holy Spirit to hear your words to us. Give Pastor Clay clarity of delivery. Loving God, we offer these prayers, joining our voices with the great chorus of those who sing your praise and depend on you alone. We long for the day when all your children will live in peace and praise your name. Until that day, give us patience and enduring hope. Rooted only in Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, if you're a visitor with us today, welcome. We're glad you're here. If you have a prayer request, you may send it to prayer at tacomacrc.org. Please note whether or not the prayer request is private or public. If it's public and appropriate, we will share it with uh, on the prayer team on the uh, On the prayer chain, private requests will be forwarded to the prayer team. Adult Sunday School will be available on YouTube or on our website starting at, at, at 8 a.m. each Sunday. We will not be meeting in person on Thanksgiving. We still have an online service available after 8 a.m. Thanksgiving morning, which will be the conclusion of our Roman series. We highly encourage everyone to join us Thanksgiving morning. Today's offering is for the general fund. Donations may be made online via our website or the church app or placed in the drop box at the rear of the sanctuary. Thank you. And now Pastor Clay. Good morning. Today we are going to be reading in Romans chapter 14 uh, through the 13th verse of chapter 15. And I think we'll discover that this is just one more part of the book of Romans that is incredibly relevant to the modern church. The specifics are different, but the issues that Paul addresses are issues that we still struggle with today. 
The issue he addresses to the church in Rome and to us is disunity, particularly over disputable matters. Unity is crucial for the church to be able to function and to serve Christ, uh, which is one of the reasons that I think that our enemy, the devil, does everything he can to drive wedges between us. And the same was true in the church in Rome. So Paul encouraged the church toward a unified commitment to serving and glorifying Christ together. Paul does this by challenging the church with four directives. The first is found in verses 1 through 12 of chapter 14. Here's what it says. It says, Except the one whose faith is weak, without quarreling over disputable matters, one person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another, whose faith is weak, eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall. And they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the living and the dead, or the dead and the living. You then... Why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. The main point that Paul makes here is that we are not to condemn each other. He says, don't condemn others. The others that Paul refers to here are classified into two separate groups. He identifies them as the weak and the strong. There are two issues that they are disagreeing on. The first has to do with eating meat, that, and the second has to do with the belief that certain religious days are more important than others. Paul doesn't specifically identify who these groups are, which has led to many differing opinions, but most of those opinions fit into two camps. The first camp thinks that the weak group refers to Gentiles who have recently come out of paganism. They contend that the issues of meat for them had to do with meat that had been sacrificed to idols. It has been suggested that even though these new believers rejected idol worship, they still in their weakness ascribed more power to the idols than those idols deserved. Therefore, they refused to eat uh, any meat because of the possibility that that meat could have been sacrificed to idols. Now that concern was addressed by Paul in Corinth, but he never states it uh, in this passage. He doesn't mention it here, which leaves this to conjecture. The other camp thinks that the weak refers to Jewish believers who are still convicted that they must fulfill the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law didn't forbid Jews from eating meat, only certain kinds of meat. But the argument is that these Jews are living in an environment in which it would be impossible for them to guarantee that the meat being sold in the market had been prepared in a kosher manner. In such environments, it was common for really devout Jewish people to avoid eating any meat rather than risk eating unclean meat. 
This would also hold true to the discussion on the celebration of sacred feasts and festivals, which are now no longer required since we are no longer under the law. So, in this discussion, who is the weak and who is the strong? I don't know. But I do tend to lean toward it being the Jews who feel convicted to follow the Mosaic Law because that is a theme that is run throughout the book of Romans, and I think Paul is continuing with that theme. So now that we have not settled that issue, let's look at Paul's instruction. Paul begins by saying, don't let these disputable issues separate you. If you have a conviction as a result of your faith that you have freedom to do certain things, then don't look down on those who feel that they can't do those things. And then if you don't feel you have the freedom to do those things, then don't condemn the one who in faith believes they do have that freedom. In the past several decades, we have seen this argument really applied over drinking or dancing or movies. I have to admit, I never would have thought that the argument concerning eating meat would be relevant again, but then have you seen some of the exchanges between meat eaters and vegans? Paul's exhortation is that you aren't the other person's judge they are responsible to stand before God. Those who eat meat give thanks to God for that meat, and those who don't are abstaining out of reverence for God. The motive of both is to serve God. So don't condemn someone else's servant. Respect their conviction and guard your own heart from being judgmental. Secondly, Paul says, don't trip others. Look at verses 13, 23, uh, thir verses 13 through 23 of chapter 14. It says, therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not, by your eating, destroy someone for, for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what you know is good to be spoken of is evil, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves, but whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat because their eating is not from faith and everything that does not come from faith is sin. So here Paul uses what is called the chiastic order and we see this pattern used in several places in the scriptures but this is a beautiful example of this type of writing. He begins with a point and we'll call it point A warning us about stumbling blocks. And then he moves on to point B, saying that nothing is unclean, followed by point C, don't destroy another one uh, for whom Christ has died. Then he repeats that same thought with point C again, do not tear down the work of God. And then he goes back and repeats point B, all things are clean, and ends with point A. 
do not do anything to cause a fellow believer to stumble. Now, in a chiastic order, the climax of that argument, the main point, is typically the center of the argument. So in this case, it would be point C. And I think that Paul wants us to understand that when we insist on exercising our freedom to the detriment of a weaker brother, we are harming the work of God in their lives. Since Paul brings up drinking wine, let's use that as a practical application. Scripturally, I have the freedom to drink beer or a glass of wine. I can scripturally show you uh, that that is true. It is my liberty in Christ to do so. However, if I insist on exercising that freedom without regard for who, for the person that I'm with, I may cause harm to someone. For example, I know of a woman who came out of a life of drug addictions and alcohol abuse. For her, drinking even a drop of alcohol would be to regress to her previous lifestyle. One day, some women from her Bible study invited her to go have lunch with them. Being fairly new to the group, she was really excited to be included. The women ordered wine with their lunch, and a couple of them had even more than one glass. Now, I can't tell you if their sobriety was impacted, but I can tell you that the woman who had been invited to join them was deeply distraught. She had lost respect for those ladies. Was she justified in losing respect for them? Probably not. She judged them which is what Paul spoke about. But were these ladies who knew her past justified in flaunting their freedom in such a way that they gave opportunity for this woman to pass judgment and in a way that could have led to temptation for her to return to her old patterns? Paul would say no. And I know it's easy for us to say, well, wait a minute, that's her responsibility. It's not my responsibility. And Paul is saying, no, it is your responsibility. We have to make sure that our exercising our freedom in Christ doesn't do harm to others. So if I were invited to eat with one of these weaker Christians in Rome, I probably would not order filet mignon. Paul reiterates that there is nothing wrong with ordering a steak. There is nothing wrong with having a glass of wine. But when that freedom damages someone else's commitment to Christ, then there is something very wrong with it. Those who understand their freedom still need to be sensitive to where other people are in their growth, and they have to guard the growth of others. In the next section, he says, do, he changes it from the don't, and now it is do prioritize others. Put them before yourself. Chapter 15, verses 1 through 6 says, We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak, and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbor for their good, to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This last part sounds very similar to Philippians, where we're told to put on to have the same mind of Christ who humbled himself and, and served us. Paul has an awareness of the freedom that he has from the Mosaic law in Christ. 
However, he points out that the strong need to put the needs of the weak before their own. He tells them that they are to bear with the failings of the weak. Now that means to assume for yourself the burden that these weak believers carry. That doesn't mean that we adopt or approve of their weakness, but that we have deep empathy for their weakness and refrain from criticizing or judging them, particularly in regard to disputable matters. And I make that clarification to avoid the idea that all things are to be tolerated. There are attacks upon the clear truths of Scripture, even within the church, that we must resist. And yet, even in our resistance to those attacks, we must do so with love as our guiding motivation. We are to care enough that we help the weak grow in understanding. And he ends this section with a prayer for unity. A unity that comes when we prioritize others over ourselves. And finally, Paul says, do receive others. The NIV uses the word accept. Look at verses 7 through 13 of chapter 15. It says, accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed, and moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing the praises of your name. Again it says, Rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the people extol him. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. In him the Gentiles will hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So both here and in uh, chapter 14, verse 1, Paul says that we are to receive or to accept one another. To receive means more than just simply to accept someone into the church. It means to accept someone into our home or our circle, our tight circle of acquaintances. It means to have community with them. We are not only to tolerate the weak, but we are to treat them as brothers and sisters. Again, if you take the weak here to mean the Jewish believers who are still convicted that they have to follow the Mosaic law, then Paul is reminding the church that it was through those Jewish believers that God worked in order to draw the Gentiles to himself. And he quotes several Old Testament passages that highlight God's salvation plan to include the Gentiles. But remember that it was through the Jews that God unfolded his plan. And so he's saying, don't reject them. You owe them. But even more importantly, Paul is pointing out that God has chosen each of us, Jew or Gentile. This has been the heart of his gospel message throughout the book of Romans. So before he concludes the letter, he reiterates this gospel truth. You have been chosen by God and have put your faith in Jesus Christ. Therefore, you are truly brothers and sisters. We are in differing places in our understanding of that gospel and in our maturity in Christ, but we are still one family. It's similar to what Paul says in Ephesians 4, 3 through 6. He says, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called one Lord, one faith, 
one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Church, I hope we hear Paul's plea for us to pursue unity. Guard the way that you think of your brother and sister with whom you might disagree. They are God's children. They are your family. Watch out for them. Don't demand your way to the destruction of their faith. Put them before yourself. Concern yourself with their spiritual growth. So help disciple them into a deeper understanding and make sure that someone is helping you grow in your areas of weakness as well. Receive each other as one body in Christ. If we do this, I firmly believe that the church across this nation, if it were unified for the work of Christ, that our nation would be changed. God's work would be powerfully demonstrated and we would be the beautiful bride that we are called to be. Let's pray. Lord God, we do pray for unity in your church, that nationwide, worldwide, we would bond together to proclaim the truth of the gospel, that we would challenge one another to grow in our understanding and our faith, and that we would be willing to be challenged, that, Lord, we would have you as our center focus, that all of us would be pulling together in unity to proclaim the truth and the glory of your name and your gospel. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Receive a blessing from the Lord. May you walk in unity as together we proclaim the love of God our Father and the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus, Jesus Christ and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.